first of all, I would like to thank all of you for joining today's mm -hmm. online meeting on the revision of the Blood, Direct, Blood uh, Directive. We will be discussing how to enhance plasma collection via increased regulatory efficiency. Although I still can't welcome you in person at the European Parliament, I hope that they will come soon. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to host this online event in this very uh, critical topic. As I guess all of you know, plasma-derived medicinal products, PDMTs, are made from plasma donated by healthy donors. And these medicines are essential for around 300,000 Europeans who rely on them to treat a variety of rare, chronic, and potentially life-threatening conditions, such as primary immunodeficiencies. However, Europe has not been collecting enough plasma to meet the growing clinical needs, and this is a urgent, long-standing uh, worry. We import almost 40%, 38% of plasma from the USA. The European Commission is um, uh, momentarily working on revising the European blood tissue and cells legislation to take into account the most recent technological and scientific uh, developments. This revision is welcomed very welcome uh, since it will allow to address the current issues, including the need for more plasma collection in Europe. This, uh, from the European regulators uh, perspective, is Dr. Carmen uh, Sadat. He's a GMP inspector at the Institute of Surveillance at the Austrian Federal Office for Safety in Healthcare. Carmen. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm glad to be here and, and share our experience um, with, you know, the legal framework and, and inspections in general. He's probably familiar with, with the differences of whole blood and source plasma. I just wanted to point it out again and, and throw it out there um, just as a reminder. And, and this is pretty much also the basis for, for the differences in, in the regulations or the slight differences. Uh, where uh, source plasma, and when I say source plasma, I refer to mostly uh, or only uh, commercial um, plasma centers, so a plasma aphoresia centers, and um, as opposed to whole blood establishments. Um, so uh, the differences are, are quite quite obvious there. Um, so for whole blood, uh, you have whole blood on the left side here in this diagram, and this is a very simplified diagram. But it's, it's just there. What I'm trying to say is here, um, you know, what the main differences are and what the reasons are for, for differences in le uh, legislation or the rules. So for whole blood, there is obviously there's a processing um, part uh, which uh, leads to different types of blood components. Uh, and plasma is, is one byproduct uh, that, that normally is. Uh, generated uh, during this, these processing steps, centrifugation and separation normally. And uh, so um, I wanted to point out that not only source plasma establishments, but also whole blood establishments provide plasma for fractionation also. It's, um, I do recognize of course that, that whole blood establishments contribute uh, to a lot lesser extent. And you, you probably know um, more uh, as far as the numbers go, but uh, the amount is a lot less there, of course. But they do also provide for um, for fractionation, and uh, most of the products go to transfusion. Then, now uh, one important difference here is that at the at the manufacturer uh, or before actually uh, manufacturing um, plasma to final products or final medicinal products, there is a viral inactivation process at the manufacturer or multiple processes, multiple methods used to make sure that, that you know, viral load is uh, eliminated. And um, also there's hold times uh, at the manufacturer for 45 to 60 days. And uh, in order to take action in case of, you know, subsequently 
something is found out that a um, unit would be unsuitable for production. So that, that gives a little extra safety there um, as opposed to, to blood components that go directly to transfusion. Of course, there's also viral inactivation steps for, for those blood products uh, in some cases, but, but generally speaking, this is, these, are, these are pretty much the main differences. I know that uh, PPTA were uh, very concerned about uh, the, uh, the new, especially new centers to be maintained on plasma master files and therefore not causing any disruptions of, of you know, continuous supply. Um, so what we did is, um, and then this is taken from the notice uh, to stakeholders uh, from EMA and the commission. And uh, it, uh, basically what we did is uh, we, we found a way to, to implement distant assessments for new centers just to make sure that, to, you know, that plasma mass file holders are able to, um, to, put out, uh, to put up new centers and to um, be able to put those on the plasma mass file and to just keep, keep their supply uh, going. And then also we do distant assessments for, um, um, for existing plasma centers. And therefore, you know, um, we feel like we have a, a certain degree of surveillance and at the same time, um, at the same time, you know, we're giving the plasma master file holders the chance to, to maintain their centers on the plasma master file and therefore keep uh, sending their products over to Europe for further fractionation, basically. How did you adapt? Uh, are there the structures that you put in terms uh, of temporary measures? Do you expect those to continue after the crisis disappears? Well, uh, we're very much looking forward to, to going back to normal and, and to inspect uh, on site. Um, I think we, we, we gained a lot of experience now during the crisis, uh, but, but generally I think, I think the on-site inspections are going to be the primary form of, of what, we're, what we're looking at. Uh, uh, we, may, we may implement uh, certain you know, circumstances and certain circumstances uh, such uh, distance assessments again, but, but generally, generally we're, we're looking, looking forward to, to going back to normal on-site inspections. Taking the European Commission's perspective, it's uh, Stefan van der Spiegel. He's the head of sector at the Substances of Human Origin at DG Sante. Stefan, good to have you with us today. Thank you, Ryan. Good afternoon, everybody. Floor is yours. Okay. So can I then have the next slide, please? Yeah. So um, I'll take the next couple of minutes to introduce you uh, into the EU legal framework of blood. And as mentioned, uh, the plans that we are having to, to revise that and, uh, and what that could mean for the access to more uh, plasma in the EU and also what not. I think it's important to, uh, to um, acknowledge the right uh, position and role of this uh, blood EU legal framework. But maybe to start first a step back and, and that is why do we at EU level regulate this field of blood uh, donation collection and also for plasma donation collection? Well, actually that dates back to the 80s and 90s of the last century when we had uh, several outbreaks and, and significant public health concerns um, uh, with contaminated um, blood products, including plasma derivatives across the EU for uh, any countries, And that dates back to the beginning of the HIV uh, crisis, but it were also concerned hepatitis and there were other communicable diseases uh, like varying Kreutz for the Jakob that was important also for um, tissue um, transplantation. And, and uh, those risks actually have driven the member states to give the EU a mandate uh, in this field to set high standards of safety and quality. Next, please. And actually we've done that uh, in a, a dedicated legal framework on blood tissue cells. Those have been uh, adopted uh, in the years 2002 and 2004. And basically it addresses the safety and quality of all the steps that um, a substance uh, of human origin, as we would call plasma, uh, has to take recipient body and in this um, those steps include donation collection testing preservation storage transport steps processing as Carmen already explained and then human application um, uh, however it is important to acknowledge next please 
that when the collected uh, substance of human origin um, are going into a, an industrial manufacturing process and with an intention to place on the market, which is basically what uh, plasma manufacturers are doing, that at that moment, the, the um, legal uh, mandate or uh, falls under the pharma legislation for those uh, later steps. So a bit as Carmen explained in one of his first slides, the original donation collection steps fall under the blood legislation, the later manufacturing steps and putting on the market fall under the pharma legislation. So in that sense, it's very good also that you have organized this event with um, representatives of, of both uh, sets of authorities here. Next. Uh, so back to the blood legislation, uh, the reason why we are um, uh, revising it is, is for, and there are several actually, I'm not going to go through them all, but uh, I'm sure most of you will know that we did an evaluation of those frameworks, uh, of, and the blood framework actually dates back to 2002, and, and we really identified five key shortcomings, and uh, I just want to draw your attention to, next please. Next, yeah, to this uh, last uh, concern, which is actually uh, indeed a concern on uh, whether our supplies for BTC are um, not too vulnerable for interruptions. And indeed, plasma is there one of the key elements. And as already mentioned in the introductory word by um, uh, Ms. Pita Kainen, the, the, we are highly dependent in the EU on plasma collected in the US. Um, if you want to increase that uh, collection and supply within the EU, then it's also important that I point you to a second shortcoming of the evaluation. And that's the fact that the, the donors at this moment uh, in the EU are not uh, well protected through our EU legal framework. And obviously, if you need more donations and more, more collections, it's a prerequisite to uh, have that well uh, fixed uh, so that um, we can trust on, on donors and donors can trust on the system. Possible revision of the EU legislation is uh, double. And uh, there's uh, measures uh, to uh, strengthen the monitoring of the supply so that we have a, a good, accurate and timely picture on, uh, on uh, the supply and possibly also on the shortages that are expected and in case for such shortages also uh, there are measures proposed on emergency uh, supply next uh, as uh, you had already the question before i think it's important not to uh, to have a look at what COVID means uh, for plasma and plasma supply in the eu i think uh, on the first obviously that the key concern is a, a risk for interruption and uh, driven by changing collection volumes. We saw a significant drop in, co in collection of uh, plasma in the EU and in, as in the US uh, at the beginning of the, and in the first wave of COVID pre-summer 2020. But we have also seen that by summer 2020, um, those levels of collection seem to have largely uh, recovered to the uh, pre-COVID um, uh, levels. Um, it is, however, important to monitor the, the expected impact on what that reduction in collection will mean for the eventual availability of the medicines. And there's more factors to consider than just the collection there. There's lead time between collecting and having the medicine available. There is manufacturing steps. There are also reserves that are, were and are available with many of the manufacturers. So um, all those elements need to be taken into account and, and our colleagues in the European Medicines Agency for that reason are doing a regular exercise with the main manufacturers, the plasma manufacturer holders uh, to, to monitor uh, the developments uh, that they expect. Uh, and obviously um, in that context, it's also important, it already came up a bit that we, uh, from our side, what we can do is, is think about regulatory flexibility wherever that is possible. I think we already uh, discussed with uh, Carmen the, the possibilities to be more flexible uh, temporarily on, on inspections. Also, uh, quarantine periods have been uh, 
brought up uh, may also an issue within the pharma part of the legislation and within the SOHO part or the blood part of legislation, the donor deferral criteria are the main elements we can uh, look in. International Patient Organization uh, for Primary uh, Immunodeficiencies, she's the Health Policy and Advocacy Senior Manager. Leira, good to have you with us today. Hello, Brian. Uh, thank you for uh, to the organizers for inviting IPOBI and uh, having the patients' voice in, within the panel. Of experiencing um, difficulties in accessing their IT, um, either because there's no there's no enough plasma, or because there's a problem in the development of the medicine, or because uh, there are market withdrawals of a product or a company, or a combination of of, of some of them or all of them. So basically, this, this means that uh, patients are sometimes having uh, many challenges. And at IPOPI, we ran a survey to understand the impact of COVID-19 in the availability of IGs. And uh, out of the 13 uh, European countries that replied, seven of them experienced and continue experiencing uh, shortages, either at national level or at hospital level. And this concretely uh, means that uh, patients with PIDs need to change brands with the potential adverse reactions and time needed to adjust to the new therapy. Either they need to change route, um, but they also need to increase duration between the treatments and decrease the dosages, and that's worrying. Uh, and in some countries, basically, new patients cannot be accepted for treatment, or they can actually not have the treatment. So that, that's uh, what the situation is for, for many of our patients in, in, in Europe. So uh, if we were to look at the upcoming blood legislation and, and see what would be the desired changes, um, we have um, five main points. Uh, the first one would be the development of guidelines, policy and legislation actually based on, on facts, science and experience. Um, we, so we, commend the efforts of international and European organizations when looking at reviewing their guidelines to adapt them to the, to the current uh, state of art of science and technology. Our second recommendation uh, would be to um, avoid wastage of plasma. I mean, we, we cannot afford continuing uh, wasting plasma. In 2016, the, the, 2000, um, the commission report uh, highlighted that seven countries reported not recovering plasma from hot blood donations uh, for plasma for fractionations. Is there a sense that they're, they're just not being consulted thoroughly enough? There, is, there, is there a reason they're not being, these needs are not being met? Is it just money as a process? What, what do you think is the main problem here? Well, I think, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly improving. I mean, in the, in the discussions, uh, it's, it's improving, it can, it can continue to, to improve, I would believe. And I mean, patients' uh, needs are not met because we basically do not, we still do not have access to the treatments we need. And okay. especially in those cases where we cannot have any other treatment uh, to, to manage the disease, I think it's, uh, it's blatant that, uh, I mean, the, the needs are still there uh, in spite of, uh, of what it, what it's done so let's go to our next speaker today from the ipfa's perspective francoise uh, rossi she's the director of scientific and regulatory affairs at the ipfa great to have you with us francois thank you very much brian and i'd like to thank you also ppta and um, all the organizers to inviting me to this forum today uh, PPTA and IPFA have uh, for long worked together on regulatory issues raised by our uh, respective members. And uh, IPFA and PPTA are, are like uh, brother associations gathering collectors of plasma and fractionators, the industry. IPFA uh, strive to ensure a greater global and national access to the, these PDMPs for the patients and healthcare providers. And this is based on a preference for and commitment to the gift model of blood and plasma donation without remuneration, BNRBD. Also, IPFA supports the non-for-profit business model where there is no financial gain flowing to external or individual stakeholders. 
So as we saw uh, earlier, the plasma chain goes from the donor to the patient through various way of collection. And uh, Dr. Carmen said that showed it. And we know that blood establishment collect blood components and uh, plasma for fractionation is a blood component. And for example, when preparing red cells uh, for a patient in a hospital, from whole blood donation, the plasma is set aside and can be used uh, as starting material for the fractionation into PDMPs. And this is the recovered plasma we talked earlier about. And the other way is of collection is through plasmapheresis. And in blood establishment, this plasma collected through apheresis can be transfused as a lab byproduct or used as starting material for PDMPs. So this plasma, whether it is recovered or collected through apheresis is one and a single thing, plasma for fractionation, the raw material for fractionation. What patients need is PDMPs. What fractionator, the fractionation industry need is plasma for fractionation to fractionate it into PDMPs. And what public health needs is a sustainable system for the whole blood and plasma change and the health protection of the patient and the donors. Interviews of the donor will be able to detect chronic or relapsing affections, risk behaviors, travel in endemic blood-borne disease countries, surgical procedures, recent history of transmissible infection, and so on. And these interviews will lead to temporary or permanent deferral of the potential donor. And these measures are made to protect the donor and the patient who will receive the PDMPs. Recently, in the context of the COVID-19 um, and with PPTA, but in separate letters, IPFA has proposed to the European Commission in April 2020 uh, as well as the EMA to take actions and temporary measures in order to maintain access of patients to PDMPs in Europe. And among various recommended, recommended actions, for example, uh, remote inspections, and we are very pleased with the outcome, the revision of donor acceptance criteria was proposed based on science while maintaining higher standards for safety of donors and patients. There were criteria to protect patient safety and were uh, related to HIV, hepatitis A and hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. First, let's talk about tattoo, body piercing and acupuncture. The literature has shown that there is no increased risk of transmission of this disease when they are performed in sterile conditions by qualified person. The current deferral period is four months and leads to a low return rate of the deferred donors. A two-month deferral period will reflect the performance of the screening test by PCR of these three viruses. We addressed this request to the European Commission, who recommended to work with uh, the Biological Working Party of EMA. And recently, we received a reply from EMA recommending working with the European Commission in the framework of the BTC legislation. And we'd have, we would have hoped that EMA would make a scientific recommendation to help that uh, revision of the legislation. So another criterion is related to men having sex with men. For some years, IPFA has kindly requested the European Commission to publish an interpretation communication stating that whatever the national level of quality and safety of the, uh, sorry, uh, whatever the national temporary deferral time set in each country, that uh, this, the level of quality and safety of the PDMPs fractionated from these donations uh, with national deferral various time are similar as long as they are based on uh, national epidemiology studies. And recently, we were very pleased to receive the EMA CHMP position statement for the Plasma Master File Certification, which actually uh, reflects our recommendation uh, of uh, based 
of uh, on risk assessments, mitigation measures, and adherence measures uh, of these national criteria. So this is a very uh, positive action. Those are criteria uh, for deferral or acceptance of donors. You mentioned about the blood guide, the donor acceptance criteria, and clear, it's clear from what you said that uh, you know, the, the science has moved on, the technological ability has moved on. You know, my question is really, why, is the, why are the guidelines not keeping pace with science and technology? Well, the, the, the guidelines, there are also um, guidelines from EMA, which are uh, also uh, somehow a little bit more connected to science. And uh, the blood guide uh, revision and the, the, the successive editions are also a, a difficult process somehow. And uh, what we recommend, and I think that uh, most of the stakeholders recommend that, is that as the stakeholder take part of this revision process, and um, expert bodies have the knowledge and the expertise uh, of science because they follow all of that and they do epidemiological studies and they have the knowledge, but we need the industry as well, the collectors as well need to take part of the, of the setting of the rules as uh, it, it it is a collective uh, process. And to the industry perspective instructor, uh, Jens uh, Rebein, he's the representative of the PPTA Regulatory Affairs Steering Committee and also from uh, CSL Bearing. The concept of the plasma master file that was already mentioned by, by Carmen Sadat and others, um, which is a standalone document only or exclusively describing the human plasma as a starting material for human medicines that can be manufactured out of it already made uh, the regulatory management of human plasma as a starting material much easier. Uh, however, as with all good ideas, I believe there's room for improvement, um, especially after long years in which there was very little progress. My impression and uh, the impression of others is that over the years, the regulatory procedures about notifying the authorities of changes in blood and plasma collection organizations became much more rigid and do not match anymore the dynamic landscape of blood and plasma collection centers, especially in a time where various member states are experimenting or, or evaluating new ways of increasing the volume of collected plasma in order to meet the patient's demands in their country. Um, Notifying relocations, for example, or uh, opening of new centers or the addition of new organization in, in the context, for example, for local or national tall and tender businesses uh, with an opportunity to differentiate between blood collected for transfusion purposes uh, and the collection for plasma for uh, plasma derived medicinal products. And with the differentiation and the definition of which is which, uh, it would also be good to, um, to set up a system, and I think that was already said by Francoise, that would allow to adopt the requirements for both these kinds of, of blood or plasma from other manufacturing uh, to current state of the art, to current technical developments and scientific knowledge. And also, of course, to, to unexpected challenges like the one we are currently in, the pandemic and the new emerging virus. Last not, but not least, I think it's important that we have a, a, a system in place that also the donor eligibility criteria may be or especially adapted to, to the intended use of the blood or the plasma match the current scientific knowledge and the technical development. Some of these requirements date back uh, 20 years nearly <clears throat> and uh, were based on, on technical um, possibilities that they are far advanced now if, if we uh, uh, look for example uh, uh, the PCR or nucleic acid testing which is very familiar to everybody in the current situation uh, can now detect much lesser uh, virus loads. Um, the regulatory context or the, the uh, regulation should also take into account uh, I think that were also mentioned by, by Francoise, the ability of the manufacturing process that have various steps uh, de designated to remove or inactivate known and emerging uh, pathogens. And all these steps have been uh, 
demonstrated in various validated studies. Um, in general, a setup which would allow uh, a fast adoption to challenges like emergent viruses or emergent pathogens, but also to new de technical de uh, developments would be much appreciated by, by all involved parties. Um, I also believe that there are, it would be beneficial if we align the donor eligibility criteria or the criteria for, for plasma for fractionation and, and pl uh, plasma or blood for transfusion between different member states, but also between the European Union and other countries. Tiny differences in, in, in the requirements, although based on the same scientific knowledge might result in, in major burdens uh, from a logistical, regulatory and manufacturing point of view. One part for sure would be uh, a flexible approach for the maintenance of, of registration dossiers, uh, marketing authorization dossiers, especially of course, the, the already mentioned plasma master file. Um, for example, the, the collaboration with local or, or national organizations in context of taller tender businesses, uh, they require frequent update of the information for, for uh, these plasma organizations, not only uh, addresses, but also blood bags and, and uh, test kits and things like that. And I, I would, I imagine a, a regulatory framework that would allow a fast update, a pragmatic update of this information, uh, allowing or, or avoiding hurdles for pickup, delivery, manufacturing, and, and subsequently supply to the patients without impacting the quality or the safety of the products. Thank you. That was succinct. Excellent. Really, the question to each of you is your key message uh, today. What needs to be done to make plasma collection more efficient in Europe? Uh, let's start with Jens. I think we we have a great opportunity at hand to set up flexible and pragmatic regulatory environment or frameworks with a differentiation between transfusion products and plasma for further manufacturing, as well as the respective donor eligibility criteria for both of them. Main goal should be the removal of hurdles for both public and the private sector uh, to ensure the supply of, of much needed medicines to the patients in need. Thank you, Francoise. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, the flexibility uh, of amending all these technical requirements and rules, uh, including inspection, should be uh, the pathway, the flexibility pathway should uh, uh, appear in the revision of the directive. Then um, a NEMO vigilance framework should be put in place. Then uh, the, the donor panel would be better known and that will improve uh, the accessibility of donations. Uh, a very important thing is to have uh, a strategic, to reach a strategic independence uh, in Europe, uh, to become in the, uh, more, less dependent of a um, third country like the US, and uh, to have uh, the, the starting material plasma for fractionation set as a strategic resource in Europe, at least. Thank you. And taking into account the fact that uh, that this plasma needs to be taken into uh, the whole uh, plasma and blood uh, chain supply. And because they rely on each other, uh, they could be, uh, they are dedicated plasma phoresis centers, but the whole thing okay. is the whole. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Carmen, 30 seconds. Uh, what needs to be done next? Um, well, I, I think uh, what, what we are what we're going to do is, or what's what's being done right now is updating the donor deferral criteria. This is definitely a very important point, uh, keeping that up to date and making sure that donors do not get deferred uh, for no reason. At the same time, maintaining uh, you know donor safety and and you know product quality. Uh, I, I think that that could lead to to um, to a lot more uh, amount collected. For sure. Thank you, Lara. Uh, thank you, Brian. So basically, um, science and technology to be the drivers of the, the revision, plasma phases programs on avoiding wastage of plasma, learning from existing best practices in some EU member states, and to reiterate uh, the urgency to ensure that uh, more plasma is collected so patients 
uh, uh, dependent on plasma derived medicinal products have access to the treatments they need. Thank you. Stefan, last words. What needs to be done? Thank you, Ryan. I think I said that it's not one single action of one actor that's going to be the giving the golden answer here. Uh, there's many actions to be taken by many actors. I think speaking for us as, as uh, regulators, I think our job is to is a lot about uh, organizing flexibility and, and facilitate access to safe uh, therapies. That's in the end our objective. And that's also what the whole revision on the blood legislation is about. But I think as we saw, that also is an, an, and does and should apply on, on the pharma le legislation and on the link between the two uh, legal frameworks. But that's of course only the, the regulatory point of view because uh, even if you have the best legal framework, it still needs to happen in the field and the, the right. actors need to do their part. And I think there's a role, a big role here for both for the private and for the public uh, collectors. Excellent, thank you. Let me bring back in MEP uh, Peter Cannon, you there? And first of all, let me uh, <clears throat> extend a special thank you to all of our panelists and speakers. This has been an excellent food for thought for us decision makers, because we need to be very well be prepared in European Parliament when we are going to handle with this regulation when it comes uh, uh, in front of us. And uh, then uh, it is very important to have very balanced and, and diverse uh, knowledge. So thank you, you really uh, provided that uh, information. And a special thank you to you, Brian, uh, Brian McGuire, who excellently leaded uh, this panel uh, to be in time and to focus on interesting uh, a point, so it was a pleasure to listen to you. And I'm not trying to conclude and draw together all of the conclusions what, what was discussed, but maybe some ideas that were sort of a, a very attached to me when I listened to the whole panel. Firstly, I guess that cautiously, step by step, we would need more Europe and European level uh, regulation and actions on uh, on this uh, uh, level when it comes to EU blood uh, directive and when it comes to uh, uh, comes to definitions and organizing the collection and maybe compensations and other parts knowing it is uh, in, in the competencies of member states. 